and I met a long, t- well, we got in touch a long time ago because you heard the seventh anniversary special with Robert Green. With Robert Green, yep. And your book, Black Privilege, was was great. There's a lot of real advice in there, which I like because y- you've used the advice that you give. You don't find that in books by celebrities, like ever. You don't find, usually the bio's like, I knew that by working hard and keeping my head down, I would eventually win. And it's like, <laughs> it's never like that. It, it's it's never really accurate. So props to you for writing something people can actually use. Yeah, I mean, I never consider myself a celebrity. That, that's that's number one, you know. And, and number two, I think when you come from a area like I come from, you know, Monks Corner, South Carolina, a rural area on a dirt road, or like a small town, when the beginnings are that humble. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to look at yourself as anything other than a kid who's making a living. That's what my mom always used to tell me. My mom says that to me right now. She goes, just be happy to be making a living. And that's just kind of like like my mindset. So, you know, th- I guess the advice I give is just practical advice because I'm just a kid who came from a dirt road in Moscow, North Carolina, who's just out here making a living. What, uh, what was it like growing up? Like, what was your childhood like sort of growing up? Because it sound- the place you're describing sounds mm-hmm. like a really small town. It is. I mean, the funny thing is, Monk's Corner was a small town that seemed like the biggest town in the world to me at the time. You know what I'm saying? Like, it seems like, it just seemed like a place that I, I would, I didn't think I would go, I was going to be all my life, but it just seemed like the big city. Like, I know it may sound crazy. Like, if I go to Manhattan or if I'm in LA, I still feel like I'm that kid on the dirt road in that small town because I, I became a man there. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't move to New York till 2006. Before that, I lived in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and I moved there in, like, 2004. So, like, my whole life, into my 20s, I was living in this town, Monk's Corner, South Carolina. So it's just a, it's just a country place. It's, a, it's dirt roads. It's, it's, it's deer. It's, you know, raccoons. It's, it's, it's a factory town. Like, you know what I mean? It's a place yeah. where if you work at the factory, you got a job. Once the factory closed, you just got to go find work. Like, it's just a... It's country. I don't know any other way to describe it. Like, and you, you always had sort of a, a hustle, a hustle and grind. I mean, I know you used to. You had a little experience selling some crack back then too. Yeah, I was a small time crack dealer. Small time. I, I was a, yeah. I mean, I was a small time crack dealer. Like I was a guy who sold quarter spoons. If you know what quarter spoons are, they're seven grams of of crack. And you know you're supposed to make a hundred dollars off each gram. You spend like two hundred and fifty dollars, and you're supposed to make five six hundred dollars back selling twenties. And I, I wasn't. I was never like a drug kingpin at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You used to carry brass knuckles. Still carry brass. Still, knuckles. you still carry brass knuckles. God damn right, I got brass knuckles on me right now. Really? I want to see. You him. never know. That's true. You can't carry a gun in New York City. You know what I'm saying? So you, you can't carry a gun. You can't carry a gun in New York City. So you never know. If you better keep some mace on you, or a little knife, or a little brass knuckles. These are like aluminum knuckles for the modern. Era. These are not aluminum. What are these? Brass. Are they really? Yes, they they they're legitimately heavy. Yes, I had to be I, I I had to use them like two three years ago. It was this guy uh, tried to fight me coming out of the pharmacy, and like this was after those dudes tried to jump me, and so it was just like that's when I started you know keeping my my brother wax with me all the time because like when I was coming out the pharmacy this dude tried to tried to just swing on me and I just had to like do him really really bad and I don't I I never want to do that I'm like not I'm not the guy that wants to fight like some guys want to fight they like violence they like hurting people I don't like that you know what I'm saying I'd rather walk away from the situation or have a conversation about the situation than actually have a physical altercation plus I'm grown as hell yeah, no kidding. You look stupid as hell having fist fights in your twenties and thirties, man. Like, I'm not fighting nobody. Yeah, no, nah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. But sometimes, I mean, I guess you, like you said, people are trying to get you to react somehow. Yeah. So it pays to be able to take care of yourself. And you got, you got wax. I have. He's not here right now, obviously. He's in somewhere. I mean, he's walking. He's in the building. Walking around. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you write about him a lot in the book as well in Black Privilege. Yeah, I mean, he's been. He's, he's a guy that's been with me for like. What, 16 years now, 17 years, something like that? You know what I'm saying? Wow. Like, I've been knowing him for a long, long time. Like, I met him, uh, it's been about, what is it, 2000? Yeah, it's about 15 years. I met him in, like, 02. People are going to wonder why why you, why you call yourself Charlemagne the God. And it has to do with the brass knuckles and the crack, right? No. No? Nah, nah, nah. Charlemagne, uh, I used to, well, sort of kind of like with the crack, because I used to always call myself uh, Charlie. Okay. Or, or, or Charles, because, you know, um, we used to have this crew called the Infamous Buddha Heads. 
So I would say my name was Charlie Chronic, you know, like my, my homeboy would be Matthew Marijuana, my other homeboy would be Ichabodism. And then like when I used to hustle, when the fiends would roll up, I'd have like a hoodie on and like a mask over my face. And I would say my name was Charles because I'm from a small town. So if I was to say my, my real name or if they would see me, they'd be like, oh, that's Larry's son or that's Julie's right, son. Right. So I would just say my name was Charles. So that for whatever reason, I don't even know why I picked that name Charles. So it was always Charles or Charlie. And then I was reading a, a history book in night school and it said Charles was French for um, Char Char Charlemagne was French for Charles the Great, and so I was just like, oh, that's a cool last name, Charlemagne. But I just spelled it wrong. I spelled it the way I pronounced it. So instead of C H A R L E, it was C H A R L A. And then like the God is just you know I was studying five percent teachings where they teach you that the black man is God. So really my name makes no sense because it's Charlemagne the Great, the God. But that's oh, what right. happens when you pick names when you're 17 and then they sound cool and they stick with you forever. And you stick with it, yeah. Five yeah. percent is is. I looked this up before, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Five percent is like, are those the African Americans that are like, we're the we're the actual Jews or something like that, right? Or is no, that something no, separate? No, no, those are those are uh, the Israelites. Yeah, they're right, right. Those okay. are the Israelites. The five percent is are, um, they're just the, they're the five percent of the population who know the truth and want to teach the truth. That's it. And eighty five percent of the people are blind, deaf, and dumb. Um, Ten percent of the people. Yeah, 85% of the people are blind, deaf, and dumb. 10% of the people know the truth but don't want to tell the truth to the people. Illuminati style, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And then the 5% are, the, are those that know the truth and speak the truth. So that's that's who the 5% are. And they believe that the black man is God and the white gotcha. man is the devil. So Charlemagne the God definitely beats your rap name, which is Dizzy Van Winkle. You still use that? No, absolutely <laughs> not. That was another dumbass name that I, I just picked up when I was high all the damn time. Because for whatever reason, uh, I would listen to people when they told me like I was crazy. So I was looking up different, you know, in the thesaurus, different words for crazy, and dizzy was one of them because it was, like, mentally confused. Oh, yeah. And then I, like, was always intrigued about the story of Rip Van Winkle because he just went to sleep and, like, like slept for mad long, and then he woke up. And then so it was like me. I was like, I'm dizzy, Van Winkle. I've been asleep for mad long. Now I'm woke. Woke. But I'm yeah. mentally confused. <laughs> Makes no fucking sense. I, I dig all. it. When you explain it, it's cool. When, on its face, though. Yeah, when you're a kid and you high better. as hell, it sounds like yeah. it could be something like, oh, that's so fake deep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you're 15, 16, and you're telling somebody that, they're like, yo, word. Especially when they're just as high as you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's probably a requirement. But how did you break out of the gravity of the situation, right? You're in, you're in Moe's Corner. People are under a tree, like you say in the book. Yeah. And how did you break free of that gravity? I mean, you could have ended up in that orbit and ended up under a tree, too. I, w I was thinking about this the other day because, you know, in, in the book I wrote, and it's the truth, like how my father would always tell me that if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to end up in jail, dead, or broke sitting under the tree somewhere. So, of course, I just learned from experience because I would, was looking around and I was seeing, you know, people around me actually going to prison and people around me going to jail all the time, people around me getting killed. You know, I was going to jail, you know what I'm saying? People, my older cousins who I looked up to and just people I knew from the, from the community that I looked up to was literally just sitting under the tree. You know what I mean? Doing nothing with themselves. So so that that became scary to me. And um, I realized that I just wanted to be something. So in order to change my life, I had to change my lifestyle. But I, I thought I was thinking about that the other day because, you know, we always say these profound things like, oh, I wanted to transcend my circumstances and I just wanted to be successful. But the truth of the matter is I was scared. I was scared to death. You know what I'm saying? I was scared to be in, you know, one of those three situations. I was scared to be in jail. I was scared to be dead. I was scared to be broke sitting under the tree. And I think a lot of times we don't realize that fear is probably the fuel that motivates us to do 95% of everything that it is we do. Like we think we're being fearless, but the truth of the matter is we're scared. And you should be. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I feel like people should live scared because living scared gives you a sense of urgency. You know what I'm saying? Living scared gives you a sense of 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 purpose, you know what I'm saying? Like I think sometimes people get too comfortable, and when they get comfortable, they don't they don't have any fear no more because like they just feel like oh I'm good, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, I'm, uh, I can kick my feet up, I can just coast through this thing called life. I think I think when you get to that point where you're not scared anymore, something's wrong. Yeah, yeah, you you have to have that fire lit, otherwise you got to be hungry. Absolutely, like a fear, like fear is the fuel to that fire to me. So do you think that? And and you write about this in in Black Privilege as well that you, nobody's really a a victim of circumstance in life, right? You can always recreate that no matter how you were raised. I think um, I think I think you can be a victim of circumstance, but I think that you don't have to remain 
a victim of circumstance. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you you can you can you can choose not to be a victim. Like no, like uh, nobody wants to be a victim, you know what I'm saying? Some people are just born into poverty. You know what I'm saying? Some people are just born into a family where both parents are, are, are drug addicts. Some people are just born into in the hood. Some people are just born in the projects, but you don't have to remain there. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think that, you know, yeah, you can be a victim of circumstance, but you don't have to remain a victim of that circumstance forever. You can transcend your circumstances. I don't give a fuck. I don't, I don't care what your race is. I don't care what your, your, your gender is. I don't care what your sexuality is. You can transcend your circumstances if you want to. The moment you think you can't is the moment you won't. Yeah, yeah, you can kind of decide whether or not you're going to stay there. Absolutely. By inaction. Absolutely. Like, you, I, like I don't... I don't think you should be reduced by your circumstances. That's why I think like people who are are, are from the hood, or from the ghetto, or just from any poor and disenfranchised situation, they end up having these larger than life lives. Because if you don't choose to be reduced by your circumstances, in your mind, you're just gonna be large because of your circumstances. Your mindset is gonna be, I'm not staying here i'm going to find a way to get out of this situation i am bigger than this situation like if you don't choose to be reduced by them then you're not gonna if you're not gonna be ant-man you're gonna be giant man one of the two do you think that finding other people's personal or finding things to read outside your own personal experience was key to that because it's right now you're saying like okay visualize something bigger Mm -hmm. get get your mind wrapped around something bigger than where you are now but if you don't have any experience with that at all, where do you get it, right? How do you even know there's something bigger out there? Yeah, for me, it was uh, music and books. You know what I'm saying? Like, my mother was an English teacher, so she would always tell me to read things that don't pertain to me. She would keep a book in my face, and she was a Jehovah Witness, so I'd be reading all the literature from there. I'd be reading the Bible, and then it was hip-hop music. Like, you know, I'm listening to these people talk about these places that sound so dope. I'm hearing Tupac say to live and die in L.A. I've never been to L.A., but... He said it's the place to be. It sounds fly as fuck, and it must be because all of these dope people are coming out, coming from coming from this area. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with New York. I didn't know what Shaolin was. You know what I mean? It just sounded like the greatest place in the world because Wu Tang was from there. Then you move to New York and realize that New Yorkers don't even like Staten Island. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's just it's just like, like music and books was like what helped me to transcend my circumstances and just realize that it was a, a, a bigger, broader world out there. Are you still reaching out and grabbing experiences that are outside your personal experience? Absolutely. Even more so now because I get to see more of the world. You know what I'm saying? I get to I get to travel. You know what I'm hosting? I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm doing speaking engagements in different places. I'm, yeah. I'm going over to London to do, to do the podcast The Brilliant Idiots with my man Andrew Schultz. I'm I'm traveling, like I'm, I'm around. So it's like, I, I'm open to that. Like I, I got a principle in my book called give people the credit they deserve for being stupid, including yourself, because the know-it-all knows nothing. And I say how you should always remain open to new experiences and new people because that's how you learn. Like growth is a constant thing that never stops until you die, as far as we know. Evolution never stops until you're, you're, you're dead. Knowledge is infinite. Like I, I can constantly learn new things and unlearn bullshit that I may have always held on to. So it's just like I'm I'm definitely always open to like new people, new places, new experiences. Like I love book recommendations like always. So you get a lot of flack for doing really candid interviews actually. It's gotten you fired four times? Um yeah, I don't know if the interviews were what got me fired four times, but yeah, just stuff I do on the radio, being yeah. <laughs> being candid on the radio. I remember one time I got fired because one of the program directors said that I told a caller to suck my big black dick on the air. And I'm like, I would never say that, number one, because I never describe my dick as big. <laughs> that's, that's number one. It's seven inches, three, four, eight when it's warm out. Um, I think that's pretty standard. Average. Yeah, standard. Standard American penis. And, like, number two, I would say something a little bit more wittier than just suck my big black dick. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it doesn't sound original yeah. enough. Yeah, so it's just like I got fired for, for that. But what I've come to realize is a lot of times when I was getting fired, it simply was just the radio game. That's just mm-hmm. the business, you know what I'm saying? People get fired, you know, and I never was one of those people who wanted to compromise because I don't see the, the benefit of the joy in getting on the radio and just doing time and temperature and, you know, announcing what the next song is. Like, I didn't want to yeah. do that. If I got to do that, then I'm not, it's not, I'm just collecting a check. You know, I like being a personality. I like giving my opinion. I like, you know, uh, starting conversation, having conversations. You came, you've come really far. I mean, how old are you now? I'll be, well, I just turned 30, 
38, 37, 38. Yeah, so you're like you're older than me, and yeah. you are you've come super far, especially even compared to other people in radio. For the age you are, you've you've gotten fired four times. You're four times further along than half the personalities in radio. We have mutual friends, Sam and Jim Norton. You were on the you yeah, were on their yeah, show a couple yeah, weeks absolutely. ago. And like those guys and I were talking about this, and we're like, man, you know, Charlemagne's come really far in for his age, despite being fired four times. But why? My my question is, who gets fired four times and doesn't quit? Why didn't you quit? I didn't have a backup plan. You there didn't was, have a backup plan. There was no plan B. I didn't go to college. I don't have a degree. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I, I don't have a trade that I can go say. You know what? Instead of radio, I'm gonna go be a welder. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Instead of uh, doing radio, I'm going to go try to get this business degree popping. Like, I didn't have no other choice. Like, that's, to be honest with you, that's all I really knew how to do as far as, like, corporate America and, like, uh, like it's like something that can actually make me money, like a job job. Like, I didn't know how to do anything else. That That's always been my gift when it comes to radio. It's like, people were like, oh, you don't sound like a radio personality. It's like, I'm not. Like, I was really coming fresh off the streets in Mount Corner, South Carolina. And, and being that I didn't know how to do radio, I just talked. Right, you just talked. I would just be me. Like, I would just get on there and I would talk the same way we was just talking when I when I left left the hood in Monk's Corner. You know what I'm saying? I'd get on the radio and talk about, oh, I don't like that song. Oh, I don't like this artist. And, I, well, you know, I get regular conversation, answering phone calls and just talking to people, kicking it with them. I remember a program director telling me one time, yo, you're not supposed to have this much of an opinion. Who said who? I didn't know that. That's, yeah, why I, that's, yeah. why I, that's why I was such a breath of fresh air when I heard Howard Stern and heard Wendy Williams and Star and Buck Wild and got introduced to Petey Green. Like I'm like, these people got personalities. You know what I mean? I, when I would listen to Tom Joyner in the morning or Doug Banks, I'm like, these people got personalities. Like, who said you can't have an opinion on the radio? These people are expressing their opinion. So I just always would express mine. And that, that essentially is the only thing that makes a personality or a person on the radio unique is the personality. And the old way of doing things is to... Get rid of all that and do what is it? Time, temperature, and traffic are those the three? Yeah, things? time, temperature, traffic. Announce the next song. Yeah. Hey, it's that new uh, Kendrick Lamar. Be humble. The time is seven thirty-two. The temperature is fifty-six degrees, and you're listening to Z ninety-three Jams in Charleston, South Carolina. Like, which basically anybody could do that. Anybody can fucking do that. It's no skill set to that. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, listen, man. Contrary to people's popular belief, having a personality is a talent, and being able to communicate that personality via a microphone or via television is an extreme talent and everybody can do it trust me i know i i i got a show on mtv or well, i had a show uh, i don't know if we're bringing it back or not but it's called uncommon sense and my idea for that show was to have a bunch of the social media personalities as panelists on the show like everybody always uses comedians and you know, different celebrities to be panelists. I was yeah, like, yeah. I want to use these people that are so funny on social media. Man, we auditioned like 100 plus kids. Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Because they're only funny on they're social media? They're only funny on social media. They don't oh, even know how man. to communicate in person. They can't even look you in the eye and have a conversation. They don't know how to... They 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 talk in whispers. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, oh, don't, they, they don't have it. They're not quick. Like, it's easy to, like, be funny when you got time to actually send out a tweet or be funny like, when you got time to think of a meme. Your writing team is sitting there, like, Googling yeah, relevant like, stuff. Yeah, like, you might, you might, you might, like, one, like, Tax Stone was, like, literally the only person who was, like, like, actually talented. How do you audition for things like that? I feel like I would crush something like that. Maybe I don't have enough, maybe I'm 10 years too old for something like that. Nah, I think we're at a point in time right now where uh, POV is so important. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what your AG is. You I know can just dress down. I'll just dr- I'll just wear a hat sideways and uh, I don't I don't even shave. Think, I don't even think you have to do that. I really think that we like you look at guys like Cal. Cal is forty plus years old. You know what I'm saying? Rick Ross is forty plus years old, but they just know how to communicate in a way to where everybody can relate to them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think that's just what it's really about. Like it's just about knowing how to communicate with people. How much of your personality that you have now on radio and television is something that you developed when you were younger before any media and how much of it do you think you've worked on and honed to be presented in the media? Um, I think all of it is something that, uh, that, that happened when I was younger. Really? You know, every, everything, because it's like my, 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 my abilities that I display on the radio, I really started displaying in sixth, seventh grade as sort of a defense mechanism. Once again, I was scared, you know, I was scared because I was, I was getting bullied. 
You know what I mean? I talk about it in the book. I was getting bullied by my my older cousins. Like I was the smart kid that was in the smart classes. Like, but my old some of my older cousins or cousins that were my age, they was like, "Nah, bro, you Larry's son. You supposed to be over here with us." So I was I was afraid. So I kind of like just just started like cracking jokes and you know saying what's on my mind before everybody else, uh, being self-deprecating, saying things about myself, making jokes about myself before anybody else would. So I was, that was kind of like, I was doing it out of fear. So it's just like on the radio, it's kind of like the same thing because that's what I'm comfortable with. I'm comfortable with just expressing myself or being self-deprecating or, you know, cra cracking jokes on people, cracking jokes on myself. Like I'm used, to, I'm, I'm used to that. That's what makes me comfortable. So I feel like I developed that early. Is the cracking jokes on yourself? That's like, in fact, I think I read this in Black Privilege as well. It's like the eight mile theory where you're like, I'm gonna take all the ammo that they got against me, drag it out, take the wind out of the sails. That's that's one of my principles. One of my principles is live your truth, so nobody can use your truth against you. And you know, it is the Eminem and Eight Mile theory. And Eminem and Eight Mile theory is like at the end of Eight Mile. B. Rabbit said a freestyle about himself to where Papa Dot couldn't even respond. Papa Dot didn't have anything else to say. Like he was like stuck. And that's what happens when you live your truth. When you live your truth, can't nobody use it against you. And that's just the type of person I am. Like you know how they always say, uh, when when you you you, you are, your true character is the person you are when nobody else is looking. So with that, I like to say the things that I don't even have to tell people. <laughs> like things that happened to me that I wouldn't have to say because I'm not hiding from any of it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not afraid to, to talk about any of it because I'm not putting on a character. I am who I am. So I just feel like that's the best way to be, man. Just just live your truth so nobody can use your truth against you. You got a big mouth but also big ears, which is what you wrote. What does that mean? What is that? Why is that valuable? Because it, uh, it means I'm a, I'm a, I'm a better listener. Than I am a talker, and and it's valuable because if you do interviews, you know when you're, you're the type of person that interviews someone, you have to listen to your guests. Like, I go into interviews with ten prepared questions. You know what I'm saying? Always, I always got like ten things I know I want to ask this person. Just ten things as a fan. Like we had two chains on the other day, and I like his album Pretty Girls. Love trap music. So I had questions for him about different things, different elements I heard in the album. I had those, but being that I'm listening to the things that he's saying. I might not even get to those questions till like 15, 20 minutes into the interview. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah, because uh, the conversation, I'm, I go, I go where the conversation goes. I'm listening to him because I don't know what's on this brother's mind this morning. His brother might have some some other things he wants to talk about. You know, like we'll we'll get to the music, but let me see where his mind is at first. You know, that's why a lot of times the first thing I say is, "How you doing? How are you?" You know. But you and gotta, then actually listen to the answer. Actually listen to the yeah. answer. You got you to gotta be a, 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 a great listener in order to be a great speaker, be a great interviewer. You use that in everyday life other than on the radio? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like that's... You, you've been married for how long? I've been married. It'll be three years this year, but I've been with my wife since 1998. Yeah, so... Years since high school. The listening part comes into play in the relationship yeah. element as well, I would imagine. Oh, absolutely. I mean, not not like it should. I mean, that's when the that's when the problems start. The problems start <laughs> when you're not listening. You know what I'm saying? Like you, like you're you're too into yourself. You know that's that's why you have to listen to your partner because a lot of times you don't you're not listening to your partner and when you're not listening you're not communicating or she's talking to you and you're not really paying attention. Next thing you know. Y'all relationship is in shambles, and you was like, you're sitting there like, what, what happened? <laughs> like, I didn't know you was upset. Like, I didn't know you didn't like this about me. I didn't know that, you know, you, you had a problem with this. You know why? Because you weren't listening, motherfucker. Gets out of control. Yeah, so fast. Absolutely. So listening is key to any relationship. How long's your book been on the bestseller list now? Um, the book came out April 18th. And it spent seven, eight weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list. Nice. And we're gonna it keep spent it. Seven, it spent seven, eight straight weeks. And, you know, uh, I, I'm sure that it'll pop back on it. After this, it's certainly better. I heard you sell a lot of books. We sell a lot of books. Yeah. And I think this is one of those books that I, I highly recommend, not just because you're on the show, but because, like I said, 
advice from people who've applied it and then turned around and thought about it and then wrote it down is more useful than somebody whose job it is just to give advice yeah. that they've never used or that they've never actually tested, which is why we test everything that we can at Art of Charm as well. And a lot of it's cool and counterintuitive. Like one of the things that, that was early on in Black Privilege was fuck your dreams. Yes. And I was like, wait, what? And I had to hit rewind, which is one reason why you probably <laughs> wrote that like that. But explain that. What does that mean? Fuck your dreams when they're not your dreams. You know, a lot of times when you're growing up in, in the hood as, a, as an African-American, the people you see that are successful who look like you are in entertainment are athletics. So everybody wants to be a rapper, a singer. Or they want to be the next LeBron James or Steph Curry, Michael Jordan. It's like, yo, man, that's that's not your dream. That's just something you see working for somebody else. And I feel like we've lost a whole generation of people to the rap game. Like, of course, you got the people who are, I guess, meant to do it, so they, they got it done, or the people who just worked hard enough and, you know, got lucky. with a, I don't say got lucky, cause I don't believe in luck like that, but just got a record to go. So now they getting show money or whatever, so you look at them as successful. But 95% of people that aspire to be those things aren't going to make it. So like for me, it's like, yo, go find out what it is that God really wants you to do. What's your what's your destiny? Even if you don't believe in God, man, I just like to believe in this analogy of, uh, you know, there's there's something bigger than us, right? And that something bigger than us has given everybody on this planet something that can change the circumstances of their life, that can bring in some money or that can just make them happy. Because success to me is subjective. I'll talk about that in a second. But it's like... Imagine it's Christmas and everybody in the world, everybody has something under the tree. That one thing that can change your whole situation. Man, some people are going to find it before others. Some people are going to get frustrated that they can't find theirs and give up. Some people are going to get jealous and envious of the, of the person that found theirs before them. Like It's just all type of scenarios that can stop you from finding what it is that you're good at. That can ab absolutely change your life. And to me, that's that's what you should be pursuing. You should be in pursuit of that dream that can cause you to be happy. Like, you know, that, that, I love that uh, Kid Cudi song, Pursuit of Happiness. But but it's true. Like, you know, happiness to me is what we're all really pursuing at the end of the day. And you could it's, it, it's probably a happy garbage man out there. It might, it's, it, it's literally probably. I guarantee you there I is, guarantee yeah. you it is. It's a kid that all his life. He watched the garbage man come through his hood and pick up the garbage and said he looked like he's having mad fun on that truck. That's what I want to do. And he went and did it, and he's happy. And that's why I say success is subjective, because success is just what makes you happy. Like, we got this thing in America where we equate success with celebrity or we equate success with, you know, money. That's not always the case. Success is just what makes you happy? Like if you wake up in the morning and you got a job that makes 30 grand a year, but your wife is happy and your kid is happy and you're able to provide and you're happy with that, that's success. So like 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 pursuit of pursuit of happiness, pursuit of uh, uh pursuit of happiness is is what the real dream is. All that other stuff, fuck your dreams. How can we tell if somebody is telling us fuck your dreams because they want you to focus on what you're good at, which mm -hmm. is like what you're telling us right now, or what you might be good at, versus telling you to give up because they already gave up on their dreams? Well, you just got to pay attention because you got to understand that there is, you know, toxic energy out there. Like I, like I, I talk in the book about a cousin aunt. The reason I call her a cousin aunt because she's not like my aunt, but she's like she's like my, my she's like my cousin's aunt. And like my Got parents' it, yeah. cousins. Right, right. So I call her a cousin aunt, you know? And I remember one time I was in the kitchen. I had just got my internship with radio. And I think I had just started getting on the air part time. And I was also doing like, uh, I was working at this record label called Never So Deep Records, which was a sub subsidiary of MCA, but they was based out of South Carolina. And I was just, you know, talking about all of this and how all the great things I'm going to do in the future. And I remember my cousin aunt came in the kitchen and goes, you know, you shouldn't set your goal so high because when you do and you don't achieve them, you're going to be disappointed. And I remember looking at her and saying, that's the stupidest sh shit I ever heard <laughs> in my motherfucking life. That is yeah. the dumbest advice I ever heard. Because to me, she was basically telling me, fuck your dreams in a negative, a negative way. You know what I'm saying? I'm not telling you to fuck your dreams. What I'm telling you is, fuck your dreams when they're not your dreams. Like, you got to make sure 
this is what you want to do. You got to make sure that this is what is going to make you happy when you wake up every day for the rest of your life. You know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, right. You got to pay attention because otherwise you're just thinking. I think the one way to tell for me was when I, when I became an attorney was like, am I looking forward to the day to day of being a lawyer or am I looking forward to being able to tell people I'm a lawyer, have expensive yes. shit? Yes. That was how I knew it wasn't for me because yes. I was like. I don't care about the job at all. Anything that got me to those other steps would be great. Now doing what I do now, I care much more about doing what we're doing right now than I do like, hmm, what kind of car can I get? Because I got money now. I don't care about that stuff as much. I love the day-to-day of radio. I am a radio guy through and through. I am a radio personality. I care about the culture of radio. Like This is something that... I would listen to radio when I was a kid. And then after I finished listening to radio and, 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 and got actually involved in radio as an intern, I knew from the first day I was in there as an intern, I love this. And I love every aspect of it. See, that's the other thing. That's why I have another chapter in my book called Put the Weed in the Bag. And put, yeah. putting the weed in the bag is just about respecting the process. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you ever seen the movie Belly. Great movie. Should have won an Oscar. You know, DMX and Nas are sitting at the table and it's these two young kids sitting by them. And the two young kids are helping them bag up the weed. And so the two young kids are like, yo, fuck school. I want to go out there and get money with y'all. And DMX is like, man, shut the fuck up and put the weed in the bag first. So he's basically saying that it's a process. It's steps to going out there and hitting the streets and getting the money. First, you got to bag up. So you got to enjoy that process. I enjoyed the process of even becoming a radio personality. I used to be an intern. Then I worked in the promotions department. I drove the station vehicles. I used to put the the, the signage up for the radio stations at different remotes. I did part-time. Then I did full-time. Then I had to go back to doing part-time at different stations. I, I worked for free for a year and a half with Wendy Williams. Like, I just enjoy radio that much. You know what I'm saying? If you don't yeah. enjoy Whatever it is you're getting involved in that much where you know like you would love the process of becoming whatever it is that you're trying to become, don't get involved. Yeah, you you wrote about that. Put the weed in the bag first. There's no cheat codes. You've got to embrace the process, mm -hmm. and you've got to focus on the work in front of you. And I think a lot of people get caught up looking at the results instead of the process like I did with law, for example. And we, I think now especially – a lot of people don't think they're going anywhere until the check comes, right? They're like, Absolutely. well, this is all BS. Putting in my time is all, I'm just going to mail it in. I'm going to sleepwalk through it because then when I start getting a check, then I'm going to care. It doesn't work like that. Dumbest logic in the world. If you got to wait until you get a check to care, you really don't care. And, you know, that's why I always tell these kids, man, a lot of them don't recognize opportunity unless it's a paycheck attached to it. You know, I worked for Wendy Williams for a year and a half for free. The reason I worked for Wendy Williams for a year and a half for free is because previously I was doing radio at Hot 103.9 in Columbia, South Carolina. I was there for like three, four years. That was one of the greatest radio experiences I ever had is because that's where, like, like Columbia was one of those hubs where mad artists used to come through all the time. Like, everybody came through Columbia. And that's how I got my interview skills up because I'd be interviewing these guys same exact way. Probably worse back then because I was younger and a little yeah. more wild, a little more reckless. You know, um, I just, I just, and I was, I was a little naive to the game too. So when you're naive to the game, you know, you believe all the world star hip hop conspiracy theories and all the bullshit that you see about these artists. So you kind of have that chip on your shoulder, and you, these artists walk in the room, you're already on them like you fake motherfucker. I know you sold your soul to get in this position. You know, you devil worship. But like you, <laughs> like my mind was really on that type of shit. So I would treat them as such, but. Um, when I was when I was working at Hot, Hot 1039, the reason I, I, I was I was only making like seven eight dollars an hour there, but Wendy was syndicated there. So being that she was syndicated on that station, she used to come down to the market, and me and my guys would just show her mad love. So I got on her radar like that, her and her husband's radar. And um, when when they invited me to come to this party one time in New York, I went up to the party, and in the party she asked me to come on her show the next day, and I came on the show the next day, and she offered me a job. That night, her husband did. Her husband offered me the job that night. Her husband was like, yo, we can't pay you, but we can give you a place to stay. And I was all for it because, number one, I was on six days a week in Columbia, but I was making like seven, eight dollars an hour. And I had got demoted to one day a week because uh, I got sued by this club 
in Columbia, South Carolina, and the club sued me because it was always this rumor that this guy was putting date rape drugs in girls' drinks, but nobody could ever prove it. So one time the girl got raped. I mean, one time the girl got raped and actually went to the authorities, so they came and arrested this guy. So I took the link to that and put it up on my MySpace page and was like, yo, we need to be aware of what's going on in this club that we frequent because it's always been these rumors. Now you have some yeah. confirmation. So these guys sued me, man, and the radio station settled for like $2,000, and they took me from six days a week to one day a week. So I would have took that opportunity, even if I was on in Columbia six days a week, just because... That's Wendy Williams, and it's New York City, the yeah. number one radio market. I want to test my radio chops here. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you yeah. if you make it here in radio, you make it. So it's just like I, I, I took that gig because I recognized the opportunity, even though it wasn't a paycheck attached to it. It's it's unbelievable. And having that kind of influence outside the check, I, I'll remember when I found out, first found out that you were existed because I'm not, an, not a hip-hop guy generally. I was. Well, I look at my downloads every single day, mm -hmm. and four, three or four years ago, I look at my downloads and I see this like spike, like burr, and I was, what, what happened yesterday? And I even tweeted out, what happened yesterday? I got a huge spike in downloads, and somebody was like, oh, Charlemagne the God said something about Art of Charm on, I don't know, what, what was this like Z100 or something like that, or uh, what station? I mean, my, oh, I'm on ago? Power 105 here in New York. Yeah, the that must have been. It. But we're nationally syndicated, so who knows? Who knows? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I remember people being like, "What? Oh, nice mention!" And I thought that that's incredible. So that's when I started looking at that, and I thought that's worth more than money. It's worth more than money. Absolutely, and that's why that's why you can't take it for granted. And that's why that, that goes back to the whole "fuck your dreams" thing. When you're doing what you're supposed to do, right? When you're doing what when you're doing what it is the universe wants you to do. When I talk about finding that gift under the tree that can change your life and change other people's lives around you, when you're doing what it is you're supposed to be do doing, you're gonna have that kind of impact. Period. It don't, it don't have yeah. to just be radio. It could be any. Like it could be a doctor. Like if, if a guy that was destined to be a doctor, you're going to save lives. You understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like you're you're going to make that kind of impact. Like the reason I feel like I have the success that I do is because, thank God, I found what it is I'm supposed to be doing. You know what I'm saying? So it just makes sense. It's not a square peg in a round hole yes, at all. Yes, exactly. And, and you stayed open to new ideas, Always. mentors from Wendy Williams and things like that. How do you stay open when so many people can't? It seems like once we turn 30 or 25 or 35, whatever, we just kind of wall off and we're like, nah, I know everything now. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. Well, and, and I know that you get people, Sam Roberts was telling me this, people go, how did I get in the radio business? And then he starts talking and they're like, what? And their eyes glaze over and they start looking up yeah. at the sky or at their phone. You got to get that all the time. Yeah, I mean, listen, man, as soon as you feel like you know everything, the, the clock starts ticking. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're about to have an expiration date. Like, I am growing every day. I'm evolving. I'm, I'm getting older. Like, I'm not into this. I'm not into 90% of what's going on out here in this, in this hip-hop culture. You know what I'm saying? Especially when it comes to the, the young artists. Like, like, I'm not in tune with the younger artists the way I probably was 10 years ago. So that's why you keep young people around you. I'd be like, yo, so what's up with this person? What's up with that person? Uh, who's hot out here? Blah, blah, blah. And guess what? I listen to some of the stuff that's hot out here right now, and it's just not for me. Yeah. It ain't, it's not my thing. And I'm fine with that. You know why I'm fine with that? Because you have Jay-Z still dropping music. You have guys that are my age, are closer to my age, the 2 Chains, the Rick Rosses. Like, there's it's something out here for everybody. And that's what keeps me going and keeps me motivated. And the fact I'm not afraid to express that. I'm growing with my listeners every day. You know what I'm saying? Like, people can remember Charlamagne when he was on Wendy Williams. Some people remember me when I was in South Carolina. Now... They can look online and see stupid shit like Charlemagne the God net worth, ten million dollars, yeah. which isn't true. You know what I mean? Well, maybe it is. I don't even know. I don't even know what net worth is to be honest with you. But <laughs> like, I I know what my liquid is. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. And it's not ten million. No, I'm doing okay though. I'm doing. You know what I mean? But but I'm, I'm the point of that is they see the growth. They see the evolution. They see New York Times bestselling author. They see me executive producing all of these various TV shows and having all these TV shows and being on shows like The View and Dr. Oz. Like, they see me growing. They see me evolving. I'm not afraid to have that journey with the listeners. And I'm not trying to... I, first of all, I can't front for them because they've seen it. They've seen how the food was made, so to speak. 
You know what I mean? Like, they've seen me literally come up. I, I grew up in the age of transparency. Like, yeah, I, that's true. I, I, I grew up in front of people. Like, literally, like, they've seen my physical changes. Like, oh, Charlamagne, damn, you getting buff. Or, Charlamagne, what you doing to your skin? You bleaching? Like, what? Like, <laughs> they, they've seen all of that. So, I can't front for them in no way, shape, or form. So, I'm not afraid to have that journey. I'm not afraid to be honest. I'm not afraid to grow. I'm not afraid to evolve. And I feel like that will keep me, you know, around as long as I want to be around. You forced yourself to believe that you have privilege being black. You can create your own opportunities. These are your, your, your words in the book. What do you do when you're faced with contradictory evidence, like discrimination or institutionalized discrimination or just people being assholes and, and throwing that stuff in front of your face? How can you rationalize the belief that you have privilege with the, the evidence well, to the contrary? Well, the belief that I have is that it is a privilege to be black. You know, um, so black privilege is a play on words. I feel like it's a it's a privilege to be black. I feel like, you know, even with everything you just said, mm -hmm. like I feel like with everything you just said, I still wouldn't want to be anything else. Like if I had to come back and do it all over again, knowing exactly what I know now, I would still choose to come back and be a black man because I just feel like we're, we're, we're that great. You know what I mean? I, I'm I'm be totally honest with you. Yeah. Like I, I I think it's a, a a good thing to love the skin that you're in, to love what you are, and that goes for anybody. I know people hear the title "Black Privilege," like, oh, that's a book about black stuff. No, it's a book about human stuff. Number one is the privilege to be alive. You know, when your father is having sex with your mother and he busted off that nut, it's like 400 sperm cells, and one sperm cell gets to the ovary or the egg and created you. So it is a privilege to breathe. It is a privilege to be a human being. You could have been a cockroach. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But you're a human being. So it's a privilege to be alive. Now, what are you? You're a woman. You're a, a white man. You're an Asian man. Whatever. Whatever it is you are, embrace it. You know what I'm saying? Tell God, thank you for making me that. But, you know, when it just comes to my blackness, I do truly feel like we are a, a divine people. Not saying that everybody else isn't divine, but, you know, I just feel like you know, when, you, when you're talking about black privilege, you're talking about something divine. I feel like we tap into a system that helps us to thrive and survive in this country in spite of everything that's been thrown at us. Yeah, you have the in spite of on lock in the book as well. Uh, what was the quote? It was like, shit is the best fertilizer. Shit is the best fertilizer, yeah. baby. What does that mean to you? It means that, you know. Like I said earlier, when you come from the hood or you come from the projects, you come from the gutter, you come from the ghetto, you come from these shit areas. The reason such great things grow from these places is because if you don't choose to be reduced by your circumstances, you will be larger than life. Because the, the, the only, like, I, I love Marvel. I'm a Marvel head. I love Marvel comic books. If you remember the last Avengers movie, Ant-Man could turn to Giant-Man. So when you feel like you're... When you let your circumstances reduce you, you're Ant-Man. When you say, no, I'm not going to be held back by my circumstances. I'm going to transcend my circumstances. I don't believe in these limitations. I'm going to get up out of this situation. You become giant, man. That's just the only way to think. That's the only way to get up out of your circumstances. So, you know, I feel like that shit that we are constantly, that we constantly have thrown on us is what makes us grow. It what makes us evolve. Like, that is the black existence. The reason that... It's such a big deal when you see first black anything. You know what I mean? It don't matter yeah. what it is. Yeah. President, Grammy winner in this category, Oscar winner in this category, whatever it is, doctor, it's always such a big deal because America knows the conditions we came from. America knows, you know, they know its history. They, they, they know what black people have been through in this country. So being that they know that, they got to salute and acknowledge it whenever we do reach a certain height or reach a certain level what's the first step in this process it, it, to to give a little context uh, one of the tips that you give tips is sort of a light word but one of the principles you give is look stop complaining about the geographical space and where you're at physically start focusing on your mental space yes and where your head is at what's the first step in that type of process for you love love of thyself realizing that your first last and best love is self-love you know, realizing that you 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 kind of control you know not kind of you do control your own destiny in a way. Like you know, we we all know the circumstances that were that we've been born into, but it is different ways that you can transcend transcend those circumstances. But you got first of all, you got to believe that you can do it. 
That's I, that's why yeah. I say that's why I say love because believing that you can do it is basically saying that you're worthy of more. You know what I'm saying? If you don't love yourself, you're not going to feel like you're worthy of more. You know what I mean? If you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to feel like you're worthy of more. So I feel like you have to love yourself first and foremost. Once you love yourself, you will believe in yourself and believe in your abilities to 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 be better. You know? So so the first step I believe is love. Like your first, last and best love is always going to be self-love. How did you start that process because when you were younger, and you were like drinking in school. Obviously, you didn't love yourself. You're trying to conform to the expectations of mm-hmm. other people. Do you remember when that shift happened? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I think about where my mindset was prior to that. And my mindset prior to, you know, when I made the transition to, to being a fake thug was I didn't have any expectations for myself except for success. Like, I just, I'm going to be successful doing something. Like, you know, I didn't know what it was going to be. Like, you know, the typical stuff when you're young, firefighter. Police officer, sure. shit. I remember, you know, looking at my, my my uncle Henry. He was a UPS driver. God bless the dead. I remember thinking that was a fly gig, you know. And then and then Biggie, Biggie was like, "Yo, UPS is hiring." But when you actually go look at the UPS shit, UPS popping. Like the benefits for UPS and everything. Like you can make a good living being a UPS man. So all of that was constantly on my mind. Like I just knew I was going to be successful doing something. I didn't start feeling like I was going to lose in life until. I made the wrong choices. And that's what I always say, destiny's not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. When I started making poor choices and I was living a lifestyle that I know wasn't beneficial to, to, to me being successful, like when I made the choice to sell crack, when I made the choice to start carrying guns, when I made the choice to start drinking, when I made the choice to start smoking, when I made the choice to start hanging around the wrong crowd, like I knew that anything bad that happened to me in that moment of my life I caused it you understand what I'm saying mm-hmm. and so it's like I remember reading a book called from niggas to gods and, and it talked about destiny and making the right choices and how everything you do in your life today directly impacts what happens in your life tomorrow and that just resonated with me so crazy like and then it was two it was two quotes it was that uh you know everything that happens in your day everything that happens in your life today affects what happens in your life tomorrow and um smart people learn from their own mistakes wise people learn from the mistakes of others because i had those two things in my head plus my father telling me you're gonna end up in jail dead or broke sitting under the tree so when i actually started seeing that around me not just happened to me but happened to people around me i'm like are you smart or are you wise because if if if, if you're smart you know you're going to learn from your own mistakes if you're wise you're going to learn from the mistakes of others i don't know what it is i don't know what it's called when you learn from both but I learned from both. Yeah, yeah. Th- this reminds me of something else that I th- I'm pretty sure I got from your your book as well, from Black Privilege. It was something like, and I might I might have to look this up, but it was something like never stunt your own growth by dismissing something because it doesn't fit your own. It doesn't experience. feel familiar to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's a lot of people can't. Uh, a lot of people won't accept new things based off what they believe based off how they grew up, based off what their present circumstances are. Like, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm a stern believer. When you learn new things, when you acquire new information, you may have to change your mind. That's just the way the world works. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to sit around and argue with you about something, and then when you present me with the facts of the matter, <laughs> and I look at the facts of the matter, and I'm like, oh, you're right. I'm just going to be like, oh, you're right. And I'm going to learn from that. And then I'm going to change my mind about whatever it is I thought I knew based off the new information that's presented. So I don't I don't ever want to stump my growth by ignoring things that aren't familiar to me because that goes into my hold and know it all knows. Right. It affects your philosophy. ego somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you, you I don't give a fuck. You can learn something from a crackhead if you listen. A crackhead can tell you exactly what not to do. Right, exactly. You know what I'm saying? A crackhead can tell you, uh, you know, what 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 moves you should not make to avoid, what moves you should make to avoid being like him. So you can listen to anybody if 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 you're you can learn from anybody if you're willing to listen. You how do you catch yourself doing this? How do you catch yourself dismissing something that doesn't fit your experience? How do you know? What's a trigger in your head that goes, man? I don't like that. Wait a minute. I shouldn't say that right now. I know I'm just doing that because I want to be right. That's that's exactly what it is. is it? Like it's like, you know, human beings, we hate being wrong. You yeah. Know what I'm saying? It but, sucks. But Even you, when you know you're doing it, it yeah, sucks being wrong. But you gotta ask yourself, do you wanna be happy? 
or do you want to be right? You can be happy and wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you can be uh, not happy and think you're right. And like, you, you, we've all been in arguments with people, and you know, we know we're not right, but we continue to argue, continue to argue. Next thing you know, you're maybe name calling and calling somebody stupid when actually you're the stupid one because you're just not willing to accept the fact that this person is right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's perfectly fine to acknowledge that somebody else is right. That's why I approach everything with a blank slate. You know what I'm saying? I don't go into any situation, you know, thinking I know it all. I'm an empty cup, and I'm always willing to learn. Like, and I, I'm always willing to share information. And if I share some information and somebody goes, that's, that's actually not right, you know, like you're in the ballpark, but this is really actually what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank you for, for getting me in on, on the right path. Thank you for giving me the right information. I'm guessing you don't have the same friends now that you had when you were growing up. And you probably have had to cut some people out of your life throughout growing up, throughout showbiz and and, and radio. And obviously in the book, in Black Privilege, you also talk about getting not even hanging out with the same kids as before because they were getting you in trouble. When and why do you get rid of friends? Like, Do you have a, a test for this? Do you have a formula for this? Yeah, I don't know if it's a test, but um, I think I think you either get rid of friends or the universe gets rid of friends for you. You know, um, like I mean, like, like me and Wax been Wax been with me for like 15 years. You know, I got I got cousins that I'm really close to. You know what I mean? Like like my my homeboy Frosty. Like I met Frosty when I was in Columbia, South Carolina. We've been I've been knowing Frosty for over a decade. Like that's my that's my friend friend to the end. You know, but uh, yeah, a lot of people have fell by the wayside. You know, like. My man Jarrell Garnett, God bless the dead, rest in peace. You know he got he got killed, so that was like a a, a close friend of mine. No matter what, you know, no matter what was going on in my life, uh, what my circumstances were at the time, like we was always real good friends. Um, but yeah, like either either you get rid of friends or, or or the universe gets rid of friends for you. A lot of people aren't growing the way you you're, you're growing. A lot of people aren't evolving the way that you're evolving. You don't have nothing in common mm -hmm. with people anymore. Like people are still doing things that aren't conducive to the lifestyle that 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 you're living now. Some people are just negative. You know, they've let they've let life beat them up and no matter how much you tell them that, yo, you can change your circumstances too or things can get better, they looking at you like, "Oh, shut the fuck up. You just said that cuz you quote unquote made it, whatever whatever." Like, you know, which I never truly believe I still don't feel like I made it you know I don't I, I won't feel like I've made it until like I know my kids kids are good and I don't know if that's gonna be financial or just leaving them something that I know that they can learn from two generations from now who knows but yeah you just you just you, it just happens I, I can't I, I can't explain it like it's really it's really something that just happens like there's nobody in my life well no there is there's definitely people in my life where I said I'm not fucking with them no more yeah, you mentioned the types, you monitor kind of the types of conversations you're getting in yeah. with these people. What are you looking for in those conversations? Um, conversations that can help both of us grow. Conversations that can help both of us evolve. Uh, you know, in the book I tell a story about how I had a, I, I had just started doing radio and I had a couple friends who, you know, had, had caught a, had, well, I caught the rape charge because of, of something that they did. And it's just like, yo, I'm asking them over and over, did, did they touch this young lady? And they're like, no, no. And I'm like, you sure? If you tell me the truth, then I know what I'm facing. Then I know what I'm up against. But if you're telling me that it didn't happen, and I'm saying it didn't happen, and the, the police are saying, well, we did a rape kit on her, and something happened, then somebody's lying. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yo, don't lie. If you don't lie, then at least I know what I already got arrested, bro. It's not like I'm going to go to the jail and say, oh, they did it. You know what I mean? I just need to yeah. know what I'm, what, what I'm facing, what's going on. And so it's just like, yo, people like that, I had to cut off. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, people like that, I had to cut off. Like, I just, it's, it's, it's a wrap. Like, we're, we're not growing in the same way. We're not evolving in the same way. I just started doing radio. I could possibly lose my whole radio career based off, you know, you guys bullshitting and, 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 and fucking around and lying and doing things y'all ain't got no business doing. You've got a great piece, and we'll wrap with this because I know it's, we've been in the studio for a long time. Helping others. If someone offers to help you, don't beat around the bush. Tell them exactly what you want and take them up on their offer. And that's Damn one of the right. smartest things that anyone can do, in my opinion. Absolutely. I do it all the time. Like, I'm never, uh, TLC had that song, Ain't Too Proud to Beg. I don't, know if you, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you want to call that begging, but if you say something to me, I'm going to hold you to it. And, and, you know, that's honestly how I've gotten a lot of things done. I remember the first time I ever met Wendy Williams, 
I'm trying to give her mixtapes and I'm trying to give her parody songs. And she told me she was in Columbia, South Carolina, How Don't Do Not Studio. She told me get the fuck out of that, get the fuck out of her face with that mixtape bullshit and take it to my, take that mixtape bullshit to her husband. I didn't wasn't discouraged. I listened. All right, where's your husband? You know what <laughs> I mean? He's like he's in that room over there. Okay, boom. Went and took it to her husband. You know what I'm saying? And her husband gave me her number, and we communicated. Um, when when I when I met Wendy again, she told me to come on her show. She was in a party, she was drunk, but no, that's verbal. You told me to come mm -hmm. on your show. Hey, uh, Kev, what's your husband name? Uh, Wendy told me to come on her show today. Like, what's up? And I called a lot. Yeah, to yeah. make sure that happened. I remember meeting Swiss Beats. You know, and I talk about that in the book. Swiss is Swiss is a giver. And I remember him saying to me, you know, if there's anything I can help you with, let me know. Well, you don't say, Swiss. Uh, I just put out this compilation album of rappers from South Carolina. I'm really trying to get one of these guys signed. What's up? And, you know, I gave him the CD. And he, I remember him emailing me back saying he liked uh, this guy named Little Rue's tone. And then he was like, yo, bring him to me. You know what I'm saying? Bring him to me. I'm going to do a song with him. I'm going to take you wherever you want to go. That's just, that's just the type of person Swiss is. But I had to call a lot. It's a great that offer. That's yeah. an amazing offer. But I had to call a lot. The, yo, what's up? Little Rue's up here. Hey, hey, yo, Swiss, Rue's up here. And then finally, Swiss was like, yo, come to the studio. It took a, it took maybe a week. You know what I'm saying? That's not even that long, man. It, it, some of the stuff could take two years. But 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 it was from the time he told me that they finally get Little Rue up here and then get him in the studio. It probably, it probably was a three-week process. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it got done. So all I'm simply saying is when somebody tells you, uh, offers you some help, don't beat around the bush. Tell them exactly what it is you want. And be persistent on getting that because I, I, I'm i a man of my word, you know. So if I give you my word and I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And the only way I'm going to really get it done is if you hold me, hold, me, hold me accountable for it, hold me to it. I think some people are afraid to help others because they're afraid it's going to blow up in their face. Shit. I, I'm, I'm afraid not to help others because I feel like it's going to blow up in my face. And what I mean by that is I don't want to be that guy that misses that next big media personality. Cause I, cause I was, I was too into my own shit, uh, or not willing to help others. Because when that person blows up, I'm gonna be sitting there looking at them like, damn, they, they, that might be the person that takes me out. <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that, like that might be the person who, you know, uh, has a grudge against me because I fronted on them back in the day. So now they shitting on me and and making me look less cool. I would rather be the person who helps that next guy up. Or helps that next girl up. Or helps that next guy or girl get in position. That's why I big people up so much. People like to always say I'm hating on people uh, and coming at people. I like to celebrate. You know what I'm saying? I like to big people up. When they dope, I like to say they dope. When I'm a fan of what they're doing, I like to say I'm a fan of what they're doing. When I love what they're doing, I like to say it. I like to. I love to retweet people. I love to see people have success. Like people that I've been watching for years and knowing like, yo, they got talent. And then if you finally see it pay off. Like right now, uh, like like Tiffany Tiffany Haddish is like somebody who I just think is so dope. I think she's super funny. She's smart. She's talented. Like she like that inspires me because I remember doing VH1 talking head shows with her ten years ago and thinking, damn, she's she's funny. You know what I'm saying? But just watching her grow and evolve, and now she's got the movie coming out with Queen Latifah and Jada Pinkett Smith, Girls Trip, and I'm reading in Variety. They're like, yo, she's the star of the movie. She stole the movie. Like, that's dope to me because that's confirmation that I was right. She you was dope. Right, yeah. I, I like, like my guys, Deezus and Mero. Like, I remember Deezus and Mero was just sitting in the offices at MTV and they couldn't figure out what to do with him. Like, let's put him on Uncommon Sense. You know what I mean? Like, that was my show. And knowing these guys are funny and just good dudes and now watching them, like, blow up with their... T their TV show on Vice, like shit like that is dope to me. Like I love that, you know what I mean? I love that part of the game. So I just want to be responsible for as much as much of that as possible. I love that. That That's like the Art of Charm value scale that we actually talked about on Brilliant Idiots earlier. That cooperative mindset, bring other people up as much as possible. And you're never too big to help the next person out. It don't, it don't hurt you to help. It, it never hurts you. It and the bigger you are, it's easier. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's easier to help people out. Like, the least I can do is bring somebody on the breakfast club and help raise their profile or bring them on the podcast. And raise I accept their that offer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Man, thank you so much. This is There's so much here. We could go on for another hour, but 
I would just love to have you back at some point then. I'm just happy that we finally got it done, Jordan. This is something that we've been talking about for a few years It only now. took a couple years. Oh, yeah. my God. That's what but, but, hey, timing is perfect. You know, I it got, is perfect. I got a book out, Black Privilege Opportunity Comes to Those Who Created it. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for like eight weeks. It's, uh, people like it, eight principles. I love I, the book. I love the book. And I'm not just saying that because you. you're here. The reason that this show could go on for two more hours is because I took notes like crazy on that book. And my our boy Ryan Holiday liked the book, too. Oh, that's my guy, man. Salute to Ryan. Ryan is another one who I've developed a great relationship with Ryan based off the fact I read Ego is the Enemy. I didn't know who Ryan was. Ego is the Enemy was recommended to me by my boy Dennis Clark. I don't say my boy because he's a grown man, but he's my radio consultant at iHeartMedia. And he was like, you should really read this book. Not because I think you got an ego. I just think that you can really <laughs> right. benefit from the things in this book. So I read the book. And I just thought the book was great, so much so that I recommended it to a lot of people, and I just posted about it one day. And then Ryan, how small the universe is, it used to be six degrees separation, now it's like one. Ryan sent me a tweet, and Ryan was like, yo, um, yo, when I, you was my fav- one of my favorite guests on The Last Word with Bill Simmons, or Last Wednesday with Bill Simmons, whatever Bill Simmons show was called. That's how I know he really must know who I am. There wasn't nobody watching Bill Simmons' show. Sure, yeah. That's my guy, but nobody was watching Bill's show. And so I was like, damn, it's a small world. So I, Ryan was one of those people, I just started devouring his work. Yeah. You know, Obstacle yeah. the Way, you know, uh, Trust Me, I'm Lying. You know, I, I got his new galley now that I'm about to start reading. But the Perennial Seller is what that's called. The new one, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I haven't. Re- I got it, but I haven't read it yet. So I bought him on The Breakfast Club because that's just somebody I think my audience would like. Like, yo, I know we a uh, hip-hop station, but no, we like information, too. This is somebody that would be dope. So back to, just to bring it all around, like, he's one of those people that just me bigging up his book. Like, I didn't get paid for that. Like, I just, it's just dope book. I think y'all would like this. This would help other people. And we we've, we got a, a great friendship now because of that. Yeah, he's a great guy. He also helps other people out a lot. And it's no coincidence that people at the top of any game are always helping each other out and always bringing up new people because they don't see it as a threat. They see it as an addition Absolutely. to the pie. It just makes you bigger at the end of the day. Like, at the end of the day, it's, it's one of those things that really makes you live forever. You know what I mean? Like, like I, want, I want later on in life people to look at the Charlemagne the God family tree. That's what I want them, seriously. And I want them to say, yeah, I remember when this person was on this show with Charlemagne, or that person was on that show with Charlemagne, or yeah, and then this person bought Charlemagne over here. And like, I want them to see that. I want them to be like, oh, this is, this is dope. Because I love seeing talent. Like, like I, I know I'm just name dropping now, but somebody like Zuri Hall, who's on E News, like Zuri, just always was super dope to me, super smart, super talented. She was at MTV. I wanted her to be my co-host on Uncommon Sense. You know what I mean? And she did a couple episodes, but then she got the job with E. But she's shining. She's flourishing. I love being able to say, told y'all she was a motherfucking star, man. Like, it's just, it's just like, I got a new show coming on MTV now called uh, Trolling. It's, it's <laughs> okay. Catfish Trolls. So it's a spinoff of Catfish. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, we're going around all these, all those little cartoon avies and people hiding behind, you know, file cabinets and profile pics that be yeah. talking mad shit to you. Like, we're going to get those people. Like, and, and, and the guy who's my co-host, his name is Raymond Braun. Raymond is a star. You know what I'm saying? Raymond is a is a is a member of the LGBT community, young white kid. He's super smart, funny in his own way, and I just think America's gonna love him. It's gonna you know be fun to watch trolls get theirs though. That, exactly, cause and you know I'm on these trolls ass like you pieces of shit, and I'm even sometimes relating to them because I'm yeah, a troll myself sure. at, at times. And Ra- Raymond is being Raymond and trying to talk his way through these people. And he's learning a lot about the world because there's certain people that I know from my world. And I'm like, Raymond, there's no getting through to this person, but you're going to learn this the hard way. So, but, but he's a, he's a star. So it's just, it's just fun to work with new people and bring new people along on this amazing journey that we're on. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to make sure you deliver? I mean, I don't know. You read the book, so it's I just did. like... <laughs> There's so much more that I have, but we it's, now's a good time to leave them wanting more, man. Yeah, I'm with it. So, yeah, we can do a part two of this later, man, but Black Privilege Opportunity Come to Those Who Created is available wherever you buy books now. And, and Jordan, thank you for having me. Thank you, man. Yes, sir.